Doc Rivers has one of the most confusing legacies for any coach that I can remember. At a glance, he's one of the most well-respected coaches in the league who has not only won a championship, but was also officially listed as one of the top 15 coaches in NBA history. Most players think very fondly of him as he has a reputation for being great in the locker room, as he's managed a plethora of difficult personalities throughout his 23 years of coaching. Despite that, Doc Rivers has also lost an NBA record 10 game sevens and has a horrendous 17 and 33 record in closeout games. With the news of his recent firing, I want to take a look at all seven times he's blown a series lead where his team was either up 3-1 or 3-2 and determine how many of these were actually his fault. The first choke job came back in 2003 when Doc Rivers was the head coach of the Magic as they blew a 3-1 lead against the Detroit Pistons. For some context, Orlando was just a 42 win 8 seed going up against a superior Detroit team in the first round. Thanks to some early series brilliance from superstar wing Tracy McGrady, the Magic found themselves up 3-1 with a chance to knock out the Eastern Conference favorites. T-Mac began celebrating a bit too early and told the press how it feels good to be in the second round after they won their third game. McGrady then went on to shoot the ball poorly in games 5-7 through seven, and Detroit clawed their way back and ultimately won this series. It's hard not to title this as a choke job considering the fact that they were up 3-1, but the Magic were a totally inferior team. The Pistons Pistons were known for being incredible on the defensive end, and T-Mac was quite simply on a heater in those first four games of the series. Once he came back down to earth, it was clear that Orlando had no business having the series lead in the first place, as they lost games 5-7 through seven all by double digits. So I'm going to say that this series was not on Doc Rivers, since he really didn't have that much to work with in the first place. The 2009 Celtics were favorites to repeat after winning the title the season prior. They were 44-19 until Kevin Garnett injured his knee in a game against the Jazz, which really derailed their season. Without their anchor who won Defensive Player of the Year in 08, the team had a massive hole that was impossible to fill. Boston squeaked by the Chicago Bulls in a thrilling 7-game series that featured 7 overtime periods, which led to this team being on fumes heading into their second round matchup with the Orlando Magic. And when you sprinkle in the fact that KG was going to be out against Dwight Howard, who was establishing himself as one of the very best players in the league, this had trouble written all over it. Somehow, the Celtics found themselves up 3-2 in this series after major contributions from guys like Eddie House and Glenn Davis. At this point in time, Celtic teams were up 32-0 historically when leading 3-2 in a playoff series. Unfortunately, that streak was about to be broken. Boston was winning just about all of Game 6 until the 4th quarter, where the Magic outplayed them down the stretch to force a Game 7. And then after Orlando got hot from downtown in the 7th game, Boston's season was over just like that. Once again, I don't think we could put the blame on Doc in this situation. He was missing his franchise cornerstone, and his players were quite simply exhausted after 14 grueling games of playoff basketball. I mean, he had Brian Scalabrini out there playing meaningful minutes of both those closeout games. So these first two blown leads of his career are not his fault in my eyes. This is one of the most painful losses in Celtics history. Most people wrote off Boston after they limped into the playoffs as a four seed in 2010, as they looked old and past their prime. But once the postseason came around, they rode a hot streak all the way to the NBA Finals. They went up 3-2 against the Lakers after winning a thrilling fifth game in TD Garden. Back then, the Finals were in a 2-3-2 format, so the series flipped back to LA for the final two games. Game six was an absolute wash, and a big reason for that was because Kendrick Perkins went down early with a torn ACL. This kind of threw a wrench in the Celtics' plans, as their only other option to play at center was a washed out Rasheed Wallace to go against the lethal front court that featured Pau Gasol, Andrew Bynum, and Lamar Odom. But after a game six stinker, the Celtics jumped out to a 49-36 lead in the third quarter of game seven. But a heroic effort from the Lakers saw them pull off the comeback and ultimately win to clinch the title. I went back and forth for a while on this one, but I'm I'm gonna have to say that this was in fact on Doc. I know he was missing his center which led to them getting killed on the glass, but with a battle-tested group, Doc should have been able to keep his team on track and find a way to close this thing out, especially with the lead that they had. But instead, they committed 12 fouls in the fourth quarter alone, which left the door open and ultimately led to their collapse. On top of that, Kobe shot 6 of 24 in this game. There's quite simply no way you can lose a game when their offensive focal point shoots 25% from the field. So despite the Perkins injury, Doc still gets the blame on this one. This one reminded me a lot of the 2003 Orlando series. Back in 2012, the Celtics looked even older and slower than they did in 2010, and were actually under 500 midway through the lockout shortened season. But thanks to the ascension of Rajon Rondo, the team had a great second half of the season and salvaged a four seed come playoff time. After Derrick Rose went down with a torn ACL, Boston was able to advance all the way to the conference finals where they would meet the Miami Heat. And when they got there, the Heat were missing Chris Bosh, who was obviously a crucial piece to this team. Once again, Doc's team was able to surpass expectations and actually take a 3-2 lead heading back to Boston for Game 6 after Paul Pierce's dagger over LeBron. Of course, this was then followed up with one of the greatest playoff performances ever in Game 6, which set up Game 7 on the road in Miami, where the Celtics had a small 4th quarter lead, but got outscored 20-6 down the stretch to end up losing the series. 
The fact that the Celtics were up 3-2 in this series, let alone even in the conference finals in the first place, was more circumstantial than anything else. D Rose's injury opened the door for them to play the 8 seed Sixers, who also took them to 7 games on a side note. And then they of course caught another break with Chris Bosh missing the first 4 games of the conference finals and being reserved to a bench role for the final 3. Once the playing field was a bit more even after he returned, the Heat were quite simply the better team. So far, three of the first four blown leads are in fact not on Doc, but I promise you the back half of this video will be much different. This was supposed to be the Clippers year, man. With Golden State still being unproven at the time, many viewed 2015 as LA's best chance to finally come out of the West and compete for a title. After knocking out the defending champion San Antonio Spurs in a thrilling seven game series, the biggest question heading into their second round matchup with the Rockets was the health of Chris Paul, as he hurt his hamstring in game seven against the Spurs. Despite him missing the first two games and playing limited minutes in the following two, the Clippers went up 3-1 after the first four games, with three dominant victories. Houston picked up a nice home win in game five, but that didn't seem to matter because the Clippers are up 89 to 70 with two minutes left in the third quarter of game six. With James Harden being five of 20 from the field, nobody else in the Rockets could lead a comeback, right? <laughs> Off the backs of Corey Brewer and a washed up Josh Smith, the Rockets came all the way back and won this game by double digits, going on a 49 to 18 run to close out the game. The Clippers then went on to lose game seven to officially make this Doc's second blown 3-1 lead. The game six collapses without a doubt on Doc Rivers. LA did the hard part of shutting James Harden down, but then got lackadaisical after they knew he wasn't gonna be a factor in this game. After a few minutes of coasting by, Houston got back into it and then seized the opportunity down the stretch. I know Doc can't make players knock down shots as a coach, but he can at least keep his team engaged. He failed to do that in game six, and then ended up costing the Clippers one of their best chances at a championship. And if you think the choke job against the Rockets was bad, the one in 2020 against the Nuggets was even worse. After getting Kawhi Leonard and Paul George in the offseason, the Clippers were considerable favorites to win it all for the first time in their franchise's history. And midway through the second round, it all looked like it was going to plan as LA was up 3-1 on the Denver Nuggets, even more so after going up by 15 in the second half of Game 5. But Paul Millsap got hot in the third quarter, and Denver gutted out a gritty win. In Game 6, the Clippers were up by as much as 19, but the Nuggets pulled off another major comeback to force a Game 7. Denver then rode that momentum all the way to a Game 7 win to upset the title favorites. I remember watching this series and being totally shocked by Doc's lack of adjustments. Three games in a row, the Clippers jumped out to a sizable lead and then proceeded to fold every time that Denver started clicking. For a team that had so many talented veterans, they had no composure whatsoever. This actually makes a ton of sense when you take into consideration the fact that this team didn't really practice throughout the regular season, at the orders of Doc Rivers. This is so crazy to me because in his mind, he thought that he was just going to take a newly formed team and lead them to a championship by letting them figure it out on the fly. If they were able to do that, there wouldn't be a need for a coach. So this one was without a doubt on Doc, given the fact that he literally wasn't doing his job with this team. This most recent series against the Celtics is a tough one because James Harden and Joel Embiid completely disappeared in Game 7, but this series really shouldn't have even gotten that far. After two Harden game winners and a decisive Game 5 victory, it looked like Philly was on the cusp of going to its first conference finals in the process era. Things looked even more promising when Jason Tatum started off Game 6 1 of 14 from the field. Just like 2010 against the Lakers and 2015 against the Rockets, when you're in a closeout game and the best player on the other team is having a horrible performance, you quite simply need to capitalize on that opportunity because they're probably not going to have that same performance twice. But Philly couldn't take advantage, and Tatum eventually got hot in the fourth, knocking down four threes to ice the game. To make matters worse, Joel Embiid, the league MVP, didn't touch the ball in the final four minutes of the game. This is really one of the craziest things I've ever heard. And Doc really should have been arrested for this. Embiid was three or six from the field in the first eight minutes of the fourth and had 26 points on a decent shooting percentage. But somehow, the team completely iced him out of the offense down the stretch. There's no other way around it, this is quite simply horrible coaching. Whether it's drawing up a play or just telling Embiid to demand the ball no matter what, there is no excuse for him not to get a single touch in crunch time. And once they lost this game at home where they had all of the momentum, it was pretty much a given that they were going to collapse in game seven on the road knowing who Philly's coach was. So once again, this series loss is at the fault of Doc Rivers, bringing our total to four choke jobs that were on him, and three I don't think that he can be blamed for. I'm honestly not quite sure how to react to this information. On one hand, it definitely makes the seven choke series title a little overblown in my opinion, but these four collapses that were his fault repeatedly proved that he just cannot be the coach of a championship caliber team, because he won't be able to do what's necessary to get them over the hump. Even though he probably has no interest in doing so at this point in his career, I think he would be so much of a better fit on a fringe playoff team. Like he proved with a shitty Orlando roster, an old Boston core, and that Clippers team post Chris Paul pre Kawhi, he's great at rallying a locker room that's lacking in talent and getting the absolute most out of them. When he lost to the Warriors in the 2019 playoffs, nobody was focused on the fact that the Clippers lost. Instead, 
people marveled at how he took that roster to the playoffs in the first place. In that kind of position, he can get his flowers as a galvanizing, fiery head coach and not have to worry about further damaging his reputation as a choker. But I want to hear what you guys think. Now that he's on the market again, would you want Doc Rivers coaching your team next season? Let me know in the comments, subscribe for more, and I'll see you guys in the next video.